going to talk about what my paper is all about. And this will be a shortened version of that paper that will be published later. Um, for the last five years or so, um, before my retirement, I taught a course at the University of the Fraser Valley called Philosophy for Counselors. And one of my students wrote the following on an instructor evaluation questionnaire. He said, Dr. Robbie says that there's no such thing as mental illness. That's just crazy. Now this student then dropped out of my philosophy for counselors course, not because I wanted them to, um, but she disagreed with what I was teaching. I'm retired now, but among the many standard Western philosophy courses I taught, I also taught a different perspective on the diagnosis and treatment of so-called mental illnesses. The course ran for seven years from seven to, uh, to, sorry, from 2015 to 2021, and it was based on both my experiences as a certified philosophical counselor and on my academic research into mental health care. Enrollment in this class was required, um, sorry, enrollment in my class required students to have already a solid understanding of Western philosophy, as well as good reasoning skills. During the 13 week course, students learned how to apply the academic philosopher, the philosophy that they had already learned in solving real life problems as an alternative to medication. Early in each semester, some students expressed misgivings about what they believed I taught in this course, including a few who were already working in the healthcare field. One student wrote, I will admit I was skeptical when I first heard the claims of the course. They were so counterculture to everything that I had heard from every academic source that it seemed quite hard to believe what we were being taught. At one time, I began to wonder myself if the exam answers and student essays I was reading were just telling me what they believed I wanted to hear. But after one class, a student told me about the distress several members of her extended family had experienced at the hands of doctors who had diagnosed them with various mental illnesses. She said my course had given her a very different perspective on her family's mental suffering. It had made her see that her understanding of mental pain was wrong. It made her wonder whether the many brain dulling and side effect producing medications are in fact optimal treatment for mental suffering. And whether the seizure inducing electroconvulsive therapy that two generations of, of her family members had endured wasn't a big mistake. Well, this gave me the idea of offering all my students a second option to the typical academic research paper assignment. I suggested that instead of writing an academic research paper, they could choose to write an essay about their own experiences with mental distress or those of a friend or a family member. I asked them to stick to the facts. First, the symptoms. Second, the diagnosis. Third, the treatment. And fourth, the outcome of that treatment. And finally, they were to explain if my course had changed their perspective on so-called mental illness. I was hoping that at least a few of them might consider this option. To my surprise, most of the students wrote about their experiences. Here's what one student wrote. There is so much about philosophy that is at the core of what makes psychology a useful means of helping others. Focusing on the mind of the individual is not on the chemical and not on the chemical makeup of the brain is the only way that humans can fundamentally help each other. Some philosophers believe without, without good reason that the brain and the mind are one and the same thing, that there is a so-called brain mind in all of us. But the mind is not a biological organ like the brain. It's harder to change your it's harder to change your brain than to change your mind. And while the biological brain sometimes develops brain cancer, the abstract mind never develops mind cancer. Mental disorders or so-called mental illnesses 
are not brain pathologies. To say that a mental illness is a natural disease entity would be like claiming that a belief is a mind disease. A belief is real, but it consists of a different kind of reality than the brain. And a mental breakdown is real, but it's not the same kind of real as a car breakdown. Another student wrote, <clears throat> pardon me, well, there was a ample reason for my mom to display depressive symptoms and anxiety. No doctor ever asked her what she was depressed or anxious about. Despite developmental years that screamed of childhood trauma and instances of isolation, she was treated as if her brain was the problem, not her past or present circumstances and their impact on her mind. <clears throat> the cause of mental suffering and distress are often multi-mental, arising in the intergenerational interactions between individuals, not within one person at a time. Categories such as depression, anxiety, and even schizophrenia aren't medical discoveries. They're every bit as generated and shaped by life events, family difficulties, community pressures, and cultural superstitions such as witchcraft, demon possession, and many other fears over the history of human ma madness. Although fecal alcohol syndrome, Alzheimer's, Tourette's syndrome, and other brain diseases certainly interfere with thinking, they're not mental illnesses. These biological disorders affect the proper functioning of the brain but they're not problems caused by beliefs, values, fears, and so on. After more than 40 years of research, there is simply no scientific evidence behind the claims that mental illnesses are caused by a malfunctioning brain or behavior, uh, sorry, um, by a malfunctioning brain, um, something is wrong here, or bad genes, sorry. Um, a student wrote, the widespread idea that depression is the cause of the depressive symptoms is not only harmful to the treatment of mental health problems, but even dangerous, given the serious side effects of medication. So in brief, depression doesn't cause suffering and misery. Suffering and misery are simply given the diagnostic label of depression. People don't suffer from depression they're depressed about something. They don't suffer from anxiety. They're anxious about something. Young women don't suffer from eating disorders. They stop eating because of what cons consuming food means to them. So-called mental disorders always have a personal history. They're always about something meaningful to that person. One of my students said his wife had been diagnosed with anxiety disorder and put on strong medications. So I asked him, what is she anxious about? He said he'd never thought to ask her what she was anxious about. International drug companies have invested huge amounts of money into various media advertising advertisements to convince mental health care providers and consumers that the mind is the same thing as the brain and should be treated with their neuroleptic drugs. The problem is that these psychoactive medicines are extremely damaging to the brain. They're like throwing a bucket of water onto an electrical circuit. It's what one of my students and I have called the biomental approach. Although drugs marketed, marketed as antipsychotic are often claims to reverse, I'm sorry, let me try again. Although drugs marketed as antipsychotic are often claimed to reverse a biochemical balance in a psychotic patient's brain, no such imbalances have ever been discovered. Unfortunately, what the drugs used to treat you, sorry, what the drugs used to treat so-called mental illnesses also do is produce, again, many terrible side effects, including mental confusion, an unclear sense of self, high blood pressure, internal organ failures, impotence, 
addiction, suicidal ideation, and even death. And that's just a few of the side effects. A student wrote, by focusing on management of symptoms rather than treating underlying causes, drug therapies create the illusion that mental illness is inescapable outside of the patient's control and must be medicated for life. My, he, this is the student still talking. My doctor told me that I had two biological diseases called depression and anxiety. It wasn't my fault. It was a chemical imbalance in my brain. He was wrong. What I had was a set of life circumstances that were directly contributing to my feelings of powerlessness, fear, guilt, sorrow, and panic. Another student wrote, my doctor was wrong. Pharmaceutical drugs to balance out the chemicals in my brain were not the only way out of my situation. In fact, they were a trap that could have potentially ensnared me with dangerously disempowering thinking, loss of hope for a cure, fear of living life without a chemical buffer, and possible addiction. This course had made me, has made me powerfully aware of how deep the fallacies in both individual and social thinking surrounding mental illnesses really are. While physicians have medical tests results to help them diagnose physical maladies, a diagnosis in mental health care is often based on a simple questionnaire. And since there are no laboratory tests for mental illnesses, Clinicians must literally use their intuition to interpret a patient's answers to that questionnaire and then identify and medicate a supposedly diseased mind. A student wrote, in 2015, after experiencing the loss of a family member, I had a mental breakdown. After visiting the family physician and filling out a short questionnaire, I was diagnosed with two mental illnesses anxiety and depression. From that diagnosis, the doctor prescribed several medications that would help to alleviate the symptoms. No recommendation for counseling was ever made. Another student wrote, my doctor would have preferred that I take prescription medications. He was confident that drugs would help me and that there wasn't any other treatment that, that could help me. This philosophy course has shown me how without realizing it, I used philosophy to self-treat my troubled mental state, but it wasn't without years of suffering and silence first. Having some form of philosophical counseling much earlier would have undoubtedly reduced the duration of my suffering, but I was not aware of this option or its curative potential. Over the past two decades, many treatment outcome studies have shown that talk therapy is the most effective treatment for both short and long-term benefits. On close examination, all talk therapies are basically watered down philosophy with psychological sounding names. Philosophy has outgrown its academic roots. Today it's a vital element in ending mental suffering because it addresses the actual causes, the life circumstances. It's also much more cost effective and considerably healthier than the lifelong ingestion of psychotropic medications. And philosophy goes beyond just treating suffering to educating and fostering the prevention of suffering that could lead to a diagnosis of mental illness. So is philosophy really a good alternative to biomental health care? Notice I use that word biomental, which means uh, applying drugs to the mind. Students in philosophy are taught more than two dozen techniques for ethical decision-making. They learn how to untangle fallacies or reasoning errors to resolve many difficult issues. <clears throat> they come to understand that emotions, intuitions, and feelings do not simply erupt out of nowhere, that there's always a reason for them. They learn and help others to learn to think about what is real and what is not, which includes not only the grand universal questions, but also down to earth matters like personal identity, self-determination, and the dubious reality of so-called mental illness. This and much more is what is included in the sort of education that can't be found in trade classes, science labs, or even in standard psychology courses. 
and the application of what is learned in academic philosophy classes can be applied in the real world to alleviate human suffering in the same way that the ancient philosophers did. Here's a, a couple of more excerpts from what my students have written about uh, the philosophy for counselors course that they took. And this is over the course of a number of years, <clears throat> different students in different, court, in different classes. It was not simply academic interest that made me sign up for this philosophy course. Just two, not two months before this course began, I was clinically diagnosed with depression. So that person, that student had a real, a real interest in what I was talking about. Another student said, my experience with mental illness has been a significant part of my life. I not only experienced it, but I've also chosen a career path directly related to it. Being a psychology major, my interest in trying to understand mental illness has peaked along with my desire to help others deal with their situations. But it was not until the philosophy for counselors course came along that I learned the problematic ways psychology defines and deals with mental illness. Actually, they deal with it very little. Um, our courses here in standard psychology uh, courses are, they, they only have uh, usually one chapter in, the, in a large textbook of psychology that deals with uh, mental illnesses. A um, couple of more excerpts. After taking this class, I have a new and more objective perspective on antidepressants and the flawed idea that depression is an illness of the brain and not the symptoms of stress that it is. I really see now how antidepressants are only a crutch in dealing with depression, and in many cases as an escape from dealing with the depressive issues. It is a mistake to believe that it's a chemical imbalance that is the problem, and that medications would cure you of your depression instead of dealing with the emotional problems in your life. Um, just a couple more here. Many of the residents at the recovery center where I did my practicum and now work with have carried the stigma of mental illness and mental health disorder. As I got to know some of their stories, I was struck by how many of them rated high on the adverse childhood experience scale and had experienced traumatic life events. Um, and then one last one. I recommended to my wife that she go to the doctor to get a prescription for antidepressants. This was the worst decision I have ever made. Not only was this extremely harmful to my wife's health, but my dismissal of her emotions almost ended my marriage. I effectively abandoned my wife when she needed me the most because I thought she just needed medications. What I've learned in this class made me realize that the grave mistake that I had made and what I needed to do to correct them, um, what I needed to do to correct them. I believe the knowledge that I gained from this course has saved my marriage which I think is, is a good, happy place to end my presentation. And at this point, <clears throat> I'd be very happy to answer any of the questions that you have. Thank you so much uh, for that presentation, Dr. Ravi. Um, everyone, you can kindly send your questions on chat, or if you wish to ask a question in person, in video, please raise your hand, and uh, we will you know, put you on the screen, and you can talk to Dr. Ravi yourself. Uh, yes, Bala sir, um, would you like to maybe start off? Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Peter Rabe, for this very interesting presentation, um, bringing in you know, the biological component as well as uh, uh, the brain component and the mind. You know, how do we look at each one of them? In fact, yesterday, uh, Professor Lydia Amer was making a presentation where uh, uh, she argued that if you are a philosopher, you have to be practitioner as well, <laughs> which means the, the kind of assignments that you said you have given to the students saying that if you are doing philosophy, write, think how uh, a philosophy is helpful to you, you know, which is a kind of a, an attempt to make them practice philosophy for themselves and see how they have been doing it or help them in doing it for their life. So this, this is an interesting uh, thing that I think all of us have to do at, at least at the end of the courses that we are teaching you know, so that students can uh, respond to that. Uh, I think uh, uh, there, 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 there were questions that uh, 
Uh, yeah, Dr. Pankas wants to ask a question, so we can go with that. Dr. Pankas. Thank you. Oh. Thank you so much, Balasir. Thank you so much for this presentation, this very thought provoking. Uh, it's, in fact, it unsettled my mind. Uh, sir, I have a two questions. One is that can all mental or psychological problem start with the worldviews or belief system? As you mentioned about anxiety and depression with regard to something that is intentional or worldview. And second one is can philosophical counseling be regarded as a preventive measure only or it can be also used in certain psychological problems? You're not audible, Professor Rabi. Uh, Professor Rabi, please unmute your mic, please. Okay, I'm sorry. This is technology overwhelming me again. Um, you mentioned psychological problems. Um, I guess the question is, what, how do you define psychological problems? I use the word mental illness because everyone can relate to that. When you say psychology, people think of the science. Um, and when you talk about psychological problems, then if you're talking about the science, then you, you must be talking about the brain, which is not what I'm talking about, right? So psychological problems um, are, are addressed in, in a medical way, which is the problem is with that, that there's a confusion between um, how people use uh, medicine to address mental problems because they call them psychological. But you see the mess that you see the mess that mental illness and, and the treatment of mental illnesses is a big mess, especially in North America, because of the confusion between, are you talking about the brain or are you talking about the mind? Uh, when you say psychological like problems. When I started with, I am talking about the mind and later on I talk about psychological problem when I'm referring to the brain issues. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I, I think that to my mind, these are interconnected in the, it is start with the some, what you are calling a mental problem and then leads towards some psychological problem or brain problem also. Okay. Uh, for instance, so, take the example of uh, depression. It is start with no doubt, it is start with certain kind of uh, disturbance in your belief system or what you are referring as intentional. But later on in, in you know, higher state stages, it becomes a, some kind of what I feel or what I think that this is a psychological problem. Okay, well, that's that's fair. Um, and I think a lot of what people have is beliefs, how do they begin as, as mental issues <clears throat> and they become so well-seated that their personality is based on that belief, their, their self-identity is based on that belief and it, that becomes much harder to deal with that. But it's still not a brain problem. The way, the way I offer to my students that the idea of what's the difference between the brain and the mind is two different ways. One is I say, um, the brain is a container of some sort and the mind is the contents, okay? And the other way is, is I talk about something like the, like a USB stick, you know, that you stick into a computer. It has a lot of ideas and a lot of um, information on it, okay? And the brain is like that, that stick in a sense that it saves information, it saves data. <clears throat> but there's also, there's also the, the input from the person who owns the computer or the stick where their ideas and their beliefs and their values and so on, ethical positions and so on are also on that stick, okay? And those are not necessarily definable in terms of that stick. Those ideas could be in any stick. And of course, if the stick is broken, those ideas are gone. And without the stick, you can't have, you can't have a place to store the ideas, but the actual production of the ideas are not the computer. The computer does not put the ideas on the stick. It's the operator. And who's the operator? It's the person. So I'm, I'm going holistic at this point, okay? So the mind, the, what I'm writing about now is the mind being, uh, being um, the, the body being part of the mind. It's a, it's a holistic picture. You have the mind being, uh, the, the ideas and so on contained in the whole body. You have the mind learning through the body. With no body, you can't have a mind, obviously, right? And, and that's how I differentiate. So I'm still, you know, I, I'm, I'm not criticizing you, but I'm, I'm not exactly sure how you define the mind, except, uh, I'm sorry, let me try again, how you define psychology, except as a sort of a higher level of, of study of the mind. It's, that's not quite true. Psychology is very much a science. There are hard facts in psychology. There are no hard facts in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. 
it's all it's all um, theories and hypotheses. There is no evidence in psychology. You have scientific evidence for what they say about a person's uh, mental development. In in psychotherapy and psychiatry, they, you don't have that that medical scientific support for their ideas. Uh, thank you for that response, sir. We have a question on chat. Uh, sir, you have used the term abstract mind. Could you please elaborate? Certainly. Um, <clears throat> abstract mind is something that has no physical reality. The brain has a physical reality. You know, you can cut it up. You can, you can, I don't know, do what you want. Study with it on slabs under a microscope. You can't do that with the mind. So the mind is, is non-physical. Non non-material, uh, the mind is what the, is a term that people apply to your beliefs, your values, your, your hopes, your dreams, your fears, and all those things, they comprise the mind, okay? But they don't, they're not produced by your brain. They're produced by you and your living situation and your experiences, right? Um, so the brain stores information, the mind, does something totally different, which is, it's you. It's it's being you. It's it's when you when when we talk to each other, I can tell what you believe, and vice versa. You can tell what I believe. You can tell what I'm worried about, what you're worried about. That's an exchange of minds. It's not an exchange of brains. Thank you for that response, sir. Uh, there's a very yeah. interesting question uh, on chat. How do we as philosophical counselors answer to the younger generation of people who are influenced by information available on social media, which has glamorized categorizing yourself under some syndrome? For example, a lot of young people resonate with imposter syndrome. Okay, a lot of people really, a lot of, sorry, a lot of young people really enjoy taking medications too because they have been indoctrinated by the older generation that the way to fix yourself is to take a pill. So um, social media and even the regular media um, are, are very, very confused about mental illnesses and uh, what the brain is, what the mind is. Um, you constantly have things like um, stories where they say that you know someone killed a neighbor or something, they must have a mental illness. You know, and, and, and they talk about mental illnesses as though, oh, it just comes on to you. So one day, all of a sudden, you become depressed. Can you imagine you're walking down the street and, oh, you're hit with depression just out of nowhere? No, depression is something you're depressed about something. It's not a thing that, it's not a thing that um, you can, you can, well, I suppose you can actually get it. You can catch it from someone else if they, if they really depress you. Um, but, but the young people, they, they have been so indoctrinated by the media and, and I'm saying the media, which is, which is supported in huge way by the pharmaceutical industry to buy their pills, right? And, and categorizing yourself gets you sympathy as well from other people. If you don't have a lot of friends, you, you tell them you have depression and you get a lot of friends maybe. I'm not sure exactly how it works. I haven't been in that stage, that age for a long, long time, a couple of hundred years. Um, so the, the point is that young people have reasons for what they do. This isn't, you know, some, sometimes, of course, it's keeping up with other young people. Um, just to be part of the group, you say, well, oh, you've got schizophrenia. You were diagnosed with this and you were di Oh, well, I think I have uh, hyperventilation or something. You know, the, the thing is, they want to have something in order to belong to the group. And our group, our society, especially here in North America now, is so identified with mental illnesses. They actually, the, the, um, the claim is that something like 70% of North Americans suffer walk around, walking around with so-called mental illnesses that could be diagnosed. Can you imagine that 70% of people in North America are said to be diagnosably mentally ill? So you ask yourself, what's the problem here? Is it, is it the fact that you know, North Americans are mostly crazy? Well, some of them are. But what's, what's really going on is the fact that the medical, the, the, the pharmaceutical industry has convinced the medical establishment to make sure that they push those pills and that they, the way that they, can, that they can push the pills is by diagnosing people mentally ill and then the insurance company pays for it. So it's, it's quite a muddle. 
Um, and it's quite a conspiracy between the medical establishment and, and um, the uh, pharmaceutical industry, okay? So 70% of the population needs medication because they can be diagnosed as mentally ill. There's something wrong with the diagnostic method, not with people in North America. And when you're told that you're not allowed to grieve for someone who's died, a family member who's died, you're not allowed to grieve for them uh, for more than, I think it's three or maybe two weeks now, they've, they've reduced the amount of time that you're allowed to, to grieve for a, a departed loved one before they can diagnose you as being mentally ill for grieving. That's how bad it's gotten. And we're also, by the way, diagnosing children now at starting at the age of five with childhood dementia or something weird like that. I can't even remember what the, what the syndrome is exactly. But they're diagnosing and medicating people, young people at the age, starting from the age of, uh, of five with so-called mental illnesses. And that's, that's been accomplished by the pharmaceutical industry. Thank you so much for the response, sir. So Dr. Navneet Chopra wants to ask a question. Uh, Dr. Chopra? Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Hello, Professor Rabi. Yeah. So uh, what are your take on personality disorders like uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, narcissism, borderline personality disorder, and so on? There are 10 personality disorders uh, described by psychology. They are not considered as uh, uh, psychotic disorders like schizophrenia in the sense that they do have rationality. They can reflect, uh, but they are disturbed in their respective manners. So what are your take? Are they also kind of myths the way uh, SARS informed us that myth of mental illness? Uh, you're not audible. Uh, please unmute. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Thank yeah. you. Um, okay. I, I agree with, with uh, Zaz in a certain extent. I don't like to call it the myth of mental illness. I think, I think it's, a, it's a real conspiracy as opposed to a <laughs> myth. Um, okay. And when it comes to things like personality disorders, it, it, the, a lot of the clients that I've had who have exhibited sort of uh, symptoms, you might call it, of, of a kind of personality disorders, um, I, I found through discussions with them that it comes from what they have been led to believe by family members, usually, usually parents. Um, that, for example, the uh, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder that there's a lot of germs around. Of course, nowadays there are, okay? So you're okay washing your hands a lot of times because of SARS and what have you, um, <clears throat> COVID. Um, but, but a lot of the um, hoarding, for example, you know, we don't call hoarding when someone has uh, five Van Goghs in their house and, and 16 Ferraris in their garage. We don't call that hoarding. But we do call it hoarding when someone saves, uh, say, um, I don't know, pie plates or, or McDonald's um, coffee cups or something. Why do we differentiate between a rich person hoarding a bunch of stuff and a poor person hoarding a bunch of stuff when they both find those things really invaluable to them to their personality, and yet one we can diagnose as have, being mentally ill, the other one we can't because they have but, money. Uh, but if, Professor Abi, if, if I could just mention one more thing, you mentioned schizophrenia. It's not a condition. Okay, it's a it's a it's a conglomeration of symptoms that are quite dissimilar. We have, I think in, what was it? Something like 26 or 27 different ways to, uh, to explain and describe schizophrenia in North America. So there's a huge disagreement as to what it even is, okay? So I, I, don't, I don't like talking about schizophrenia as a condition because it isn't. It's a catch-all. It's when you don't know what it is, you go, you put it in that pail and you say, oh, it's, uh, it's schizophrenia because I can't, I don't know where else to put it. And that's how schizophrenia was born, was, was it was a collection of, of symptoms that really didn't believe in any, it belong in any category. You have to remember that the medical establishment loves categories and they like pigeonholing people so that they can sell you that pill for this condition and that pill for this condition, okay? Pigeonholing is very important and, and diagnosing is very important to the pharmaceutical industry. So they can tell you what you need to take for your condition. All right. Schizophrenia was a made up condition so that, that people could be given pills where we weren't sure or the, the diagnosticians weren't sure what other category they, they belonged in. I'm okay. sorry, I, I interrupted. And, yeah, yeah, question. but, but uh, I, I think I, I, I am not convinced uh, because uh, when you are saying an OCD person washing his hands repeatedly, they, they wash it 70, 80 times. 
uh, it's too much and in in they have intrusive thoughts which is really uh, uh, troubling them they don't want those thoughts and they are repeating again and again and again irrational way so why not to consider it seriously as an illness mental illness and and uh, regarding schizophrenia uh, i think it's a spectrum disorder like you said okay there there are variations but but uh, but there are serious cases uh, uh, whatever i could uh, see on the research reports that brain tissue parts of brain tissues are missing in their uh, fmri scans not true no not true well no, I, I'm okay i'm sorry but but the research the, the medical research was was um was how, how should i put it skewed so that the the brains that were investigated had, that was from schizophrenic patients brains were investigated with huge holes in them it was later discovered that those holes were produced by the medication that those people had been on for 20 or 30 years anti schizophrenic medication had ruined their brains that's where the holes came from, not from schizophrenia. You're talking about uh, confused thinking that starts at usually late teenagerhood. Okay, we have. I, I I know a young man. I know I knew their family. He was he was a, a, a friend of my son, and he would, we got to know them when he was about oh six or seven years old, and they grew up together. And this young man, the household was absolutely insane. Okay, they believed in witchcraft and fairies and, and, and you know, the whole, the whole gamut of nonsense. By the time he was 15 and 16, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and he was on heavy medication. If his brain had been removed, they would have found holes in it because of the medication. That's what the research says, not because of schizophrenia. Schizophrenia is just a disturbed thinking, okay? Okay, what for OCD? We should move to the next question. There, there are other people as well. Yeah, I'll get to Dr. Pratibha Sharma in a minute. So there's a very interesting question on chat, I think, which is uh, apt for right now. Uh, the question says, do you think the philosophical counselor needs to be trained in psychological methods of diagnosis of mental disorders and diseases? Yes, I do. And the reason for that is because um, philosophical counseling, in my experience, is always the last thing that a person tries when they've tried all the other different kinds of, of therapy and counseling. So they come to the philosophical counselor for saying, well, I may as well give this a try too. Literally, I've had people say that, okay? Just one, excuse me, one second. So now you have a, you have a client coming to you saying, well, you're better than nothing because I've tried everything else. Thank you very much. Um, but they say, you know, here's what my psychiatrist said. And, and then as you're talking to them, as they, you know, they stay for the counseling and they come back for another visit and so on and so forth, um, you, you start to, they, they give you more and more insight as to what they were told about themselves and how it's affected their lives and, and ruined their lives in, in, the many, in many ways. Um, so I highly recommend that philosophical counselor, if you want to go into philosophical counseling, that you make yourself aware um, to a certain extent about the medication out there and what it does, and especially the side effects, make sure you, you know, because people, the, the clients will say, well, I, I'm on such and such. What do you think about that? I usually don't have an opinion on it. You know, I say, well, go to Google, check it. You can learn, you can see the side effects and so on, you know. And I also say things like, if it helps, fine. If it makes you feel better, fine. But does it solve your problem, right? So there's, a, I'm, I'm really upset about a relationship that I had that fell apart. I'm really down, I, I'm really depressed and so on. I'm taking antidepressants. First thing I say, well, the research shows, and I've got, I've got scads of information to back this up, that the 10 major antidepressants that are on the market in North America are no better than placebos. That's what the research shows. So you're wasting your money if you're buying antidepressants, but if they make you feel better, so much the better. If placebos make you feel better, uh, go for it, you know? Um, so that's one thing, <clears throat> the whole medication thing. Um, clients that come to me, it hardly ever fails. They will talk about medication because that's the way the world is built right now, okay? The other thing they do, of course, is say, well, I was diagnosed with this and I was diagnosed with that. And I was diagnosed with this. And I say, okay, let's work through this. Let's see what's going on here, okay? Uh, you're depressed about what? Oh, uh, I've never been asked that question, you know, like, like I mentioned in my presentation. Um, you're anxious. What are you anxious about? You know, so again, there's an anxiety. They're given a pill. The pill makes them feel better. It brings them down. Okay. But what they're anxious about is not gone. It's still there. They're just feeling better. So 
I never dissuade people from doing things, you know, taking pills that make them feel better, except I warn them about the side effects. But I also ask them, why? What is it that you're feeling? What's going on, right? What's happening in your life? That's what philosophical counseling is all about. And but but without the information that you have as a as a philosophical counselor about psychology and, and psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, even the unconscious, are you kidding me? There's no such thing as the unconscious. That's all, it's all been dismissed now in, in the literature. It's all gone. It's something that Freud created because it helped him to explain things to people he, when he didn't know how to explain it. If you read Freud cases, you can see how philosophy comes into it. But he wasn't fair because he never admitted that he studied philosophy. Okay. Anyway, the question that you asked was about psychology <clears throat> and psychoanalysis and, and all that. And I'm saying, yes, yes, please make yourself aware so that you're your clients know that you're not just a philosopher, you're also well informed about the other stuff out there that's hurting them. Thank you so much for the response, Dr. Abhi. Uh, Dr. Pratipa Sharma, please. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. And thank you, Dr. Abhi, for this uh, interesting uh, talk. I want to ask about the abstract mind and the biological brain, the distinction that you have drawn between the two. I would say that there's certain uh, a certain kind of interaction between the, the two. It cannot be denied. I'm not talking of the pineal gland where mind and body takes place, but there's certainly some kind of interaction which can just not be denied because, say, I'm not going into the examples that Dr. Navneet Chopra cited of the OCD or schizophrenia, but think of the simple situation of lying. When one lies, one manipulates in his mind, the abstract mind, and this can be seen through the lie detector, which is, I mean to say that physiological changes can be noticed in one's brain, even before the medication is started. You are saying that this impact comes after the medication, but before the medication begins, whatever one thinks, whatever one manipulates, if one is put on uh, uh, this kind of, um, of uh, some kind of a situation, the medical situation, the psychologists can notice the changes in the brain waves. What do you say about it? Thank you. I, thank you for the question. I, I totally agree with you. The psychologists, um, they are very well of lie detector. They, they're very well aware of lie detector tests because lie detector tests are physical. They detect the physical things going on in your brain, which is the electrical circuits that are running around there. Your brain is active all the time, whether you're speaking or thinking or, or even sleeping. Um, and so the lie detector test or anything else that, that um, um, you know, like blood pressure tests and so on, all those things measure physical uh, reactions to whatever's going on in your life. And, and clearly, if you're bothered by something, your heart rate's going to go up, your blood pressure is going to go up, and, and people live with that stress sometimes, you know, for days or, or for weeks until the situation clears up. So there's clearly a connection. And this is, again, with the stuff I've been writing about recently, clearly a strong connection between the mind and the body. After all, when I say, you know, I'm going to raise my arm, my arm goes up. And it was a decision I made. It was an intention I had. It wasn't something my brain decided I should do, right? So there's clearly a connection between the mind and the brain. But they're not the same thing. Because I have a belief when it comes to my arm, I have a belief that if I raise my arm right now and scratch my left ear, I would look pretty silly. So I'm not going to do it. And that's the difference between physical manifestations, things that happen in your body by themselves to keep you alive and keep you moving. And the things that I can control by thinking about and, and saying, I'm not gonna do that, or I am gonna do that, or I disagree with that and so on and so forth. So the mind is, is clearly part of the body and, and acts on the body. Um, I, I tell my students I, when I was still teaching, I used to say something like, you know, when you when you when you hit your your thumb with a hammer, your mind is certainly going to be paying attention to that thumb for a long time. You're going to be very aware of it, okay? But the the opposite is also true, where you say, I'm not going to hit my thumb with a hammer. I've just decided I'm not going to do it, no matter what my body wants to do, right? So there's a definite interaction between the two, and and the mind. Um, the, your thoughts and beliefs come from your body. The thoughts and beliefs that you have about how cold something is or, or how bright something is or, or where it's located, uh, where did I put that? Um, you know, those are the kind of things that your mind works on. 
with the brain. The brain's got it stashed in there where your keys are. You just can't think of it right now. And that's you searching. Okay, that's you. That's you made a decision. I want to find my keys. And then it goes and looks in the file cabinet in there in your brain and goes and finds where you left your keys, hopefully, not always. Um, but so there's a there's a very close connection between brain and mind. And, and when it comes to, well, how is it possible that my arm can raise when I think about raising my arm? Well, think about um, the, the robotic arms that they're producing now. That could, you, know, you can type in the computer message that the, the computer should raise the arm. What, what's the connection between the computer and the arm? Why does the electronic arm go up? Well, there's something going on. There's something being transmitted between the computer and the electronic arm over there. And they're usually called electrons. Okay, fine. But there's still someone here typing on the keyboard to make that arm go up. There's a, there's a thought process that goes on. The computer does not decide when the arm should go up. Now, I should put a word of caution in here. When you talk about artificial intelligence, we're getting more and more and more closer to the computer actually making decisions when it wants to raise the arm or not. And that's a whole other discussion topic when you talk about artificial intelligence.